Hello, and welcome uh, to this presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, but usually one that nobody likes to talk about, which is downtime and disaster recovery and the dark side of what we do uh, in, in information technology. Uh, for those of you who weren't in attendance at our uh, workshop yesterday, we spent two hours in a, a two-session workshop discussing a lot of this turf, the intersection of data management, storage management, and data protection. Uh, uh, however, uh, we're not going to belabor the same points we did yesterday. We've kind of synopsed that stuff plus added uh, a little more added value here so I can quickly communicate to you a few considerations that might help you as you go about doing your own continuity plans for your organization. This is the required uh, 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 deferral slide, so if I say anything that CA doesn't agree with, they're off the hook, it's all on me, and uh, I'm good with that, okay? Um, oh, today, basically, what we're going to talk about is, first of all, the hype around uh, high availability. There are a lot of people who are saying high availability trumps DR. Uh, I, I don't believe that for a second. Uh, we're going to talk about the affordability of um, uh, continuity plans and the need for them, because uh, a lot of people simply aren't doing them because they claim that they're too expensive and they're just more insurance, which is incorrect. Thirdly. We're going to talk a little bit about where we stand with today's technology, architectures, et cetera, and then we're going to look at uh, top 10 best practices for getting the job done. If you haven't started a DR plan, this is a good place to start. If you have one already, this might provide you some criteria for reviewing uh, the, the, the nature of what you're doing. I also take a holistic view. This is not going to be mainframe centric. It's going to be mainframe in the context of the way mainframes tend to be used today, which is when, uh, within a, a mixed environment of uh, uh, oftentimes hypervisor computing, uh, big data analytics uh, done with uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 distributed mapping of workload across it, uh, across many x86 platforms, and of course even the, the, the thing that opens the door for all the security risks that we have today, which are all the mobile apps that are out there right now. We have to consider that because data flows into the organization from the mobile app into these systems of integration, uh, interaction, and uh, uh, that begins the corruption. That's actually contributed a great deal to the, the uh, increase of what analysts are calling the, the increasing uh, footprint or target uh, attack surface of mainframes. Mainframes used to be considered largely invulnerable to security attacks. Now they're right in the pathway and there are numerous ways to get to them. And since we've moved to, uh, uh, to Linux-based operating systems on many mainframes, sometimes the, the knowledge and skill set that are required to hack a mainframe are, uh, is now more widespread than it has ever been in the past. Uh, and then we'll, we'll do a quick summary. Okay, let's just start off with this. I mean, this is kind of a summary of what the value proposition or the value case is for all the cloud stuff we've been talking about. Why would you want to have your data center down here where the, the world is unfriendly and uh, you know there's lots of thunder and lightning and big waves when we could just do it all up in the sky where there are white turtle doves and rainbows and hot air balloons and all that kind of stuff. Um, frankly, I find the hype deafening here. A lot of people are saying, you know, uh, we don't really need disaster recovery anymore. We don't even have to focus on that. That's your father's old Oldsmobile. What we do is we just double up on infrastructure and have failover clustering for everything. That fixes the problem and uh, voila, disaster recovery is instantaneous and complete. Uh, even in mainframes, we have uh, 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 LPAR replication. We have uh, various ways to uh, use memory-to-memory -memory mapping uh, that are supposedly increasing the resiliency of the mainframe. To a certain extent, that's true from a technical standpoint, but it doesn't safeguard us against other kinds of threats, and we'll get there in a second. Uh, we also uh, uh, have seen the advent or the increase of always-on computing. When I first started in computing as a night operator uh, 32 years ago uh, in a mainframe shop for a mortgage banking company, uh, there were shifts and we ran shifts, but there was a lot of time where the system was kind of doing its own maintenance and that's what the night operator was basically working on was you get a prompt and you'd have to key in a response to the prompt and uh, that was basically helping the system maintain itself and park data where it needed to go do all the back end batch processing during the night. Uh, today we have systems that are obviously available 24-7 because in a mobile commerce environment your customers are worldwide, they're accessing via network access through the internet, 
they may be you know in outer Mongolia or they may be just down the street. So your your systems and applications need to be available to them 24/7. So continuous operation is highly prized, and I get that. We we have to make sure we're we're providing uh, certain capabilities. And of course, there's a emphasis on doing everything with great agility. Who doesn't want that? I mean, we've always wanted to do that. Uh, but today, it's become almost, it's gone beyond a mantra to almost a cult. Agility is a cult. It's unfortunately a cult that it's really hard to measure, but it, it's one where that's what everybody aspires to, the ability to, you call up the IT department and you say, look, I'm adding five, uh, 500 more people to this application. I need you to build out infrastructure to support those 500 people, and I need it like tomorrow. And right now, in the old-fashioned way of allocation and getting the inventory of the resources that are required and so forth, that may take 30 days. And nobody wants to ma wait like that. So we have uh, spoiled brats <laughs> and millennials who think everything should be available just when they want it. Anyway, but uh, the point is, though, that even with these changes, these strategies of full redundancy have always been part of the mix of disaster recovery. There's nothing new under the sun. Uh, I showed this slide in my workshop yesterday, but I'm going to go back to it because I think it's kind of important. This is an illustration I had in the first book that I wrote on disaster recovery. I've written like 18 books and five of them were on DR. And my first book was on DR and it, it was uh, the first book on DR that ever appeared in the market. <clears throat> and we used to say a laissez-faire strategy was make a tape backup of your data and store it off-site. And then cross your fingers and hope that you didn't get the bad disaster. Uh, and if you did, just make an arrangement with your vendor to drop ship you the next box off the line uh, as quickly as they could, okay? And that was your disaster recovery plan. Really wasn't much of a plan, but it did at least focus on preserving the one irreplaceable asset, which is your data, right? And at the other end, for companies that had deep pockets, and these were usually banks uh, back in the day, you had full redundancy. Build yourself a second data center. Uh, spread the workload between the two data centers, and if one data center burns down, the other one takes on the full load. There's no interruption in service at all. Okay? However, that was extremely expensive. So basically, when you looked at it from a practical standpoint, time to data was reduced. How quickly we could get data back to a usable form was reduced the further you went to the right on this spectrum. That's more of a high availability architecture. Okay? However, the cost and the complexity to implement and maintain that strategy uh, actually decreased the more you went to the left. You know, taking a tape backup was fairly routine. We could do that. Storing it off-site, fairly routine. We could do that. However, if you had a fully redundant data center, anytime you made a change over in data center A, you had to send somebody in a car over to data center B to do the same change over there, or else your two environments were no longer in sync with each other. So uh, it became a little more painful, a little more costly. Uh, for companies that saw the merit of having the, the always-on operations, they went full redundancy if they had the bank book for it. It's always been a, a trade-off between what is the most efficacious strategy and what you have the budget for, right? Management holds the purse strings. And uh, uh, I'll repeat this a couple of times, of course, in this presentation. If you don't have management buy-in when you start this process, your best disaster recovery plan is going to be an up-to-date resume. You know, not, not, you're never going to get anywhere. Okay, and today, if you take that model forward, this is what we, what we hear the folks, particularly in the hypervisor space, mostly talking about. It, it has always been the case that the three tasks that needed to be performed in any kind of disaster recovery situation were, number one, recover your data to a usable form. Number two, rehost your applications uh, in whatever platform they're going to go on. And number three, reconnect your users or your networks so that you would be able to make whatever your alternative hosting environment uh, operational and accessible by people who needed to use it to get work done, okay? Those were your three basic things. Today, we have laissez-faire with a backup, and we're going to have to replace everything. When we do uh, that particular kind of strategy, which is kind of the cheapest strategy you can think of, use a cloud, back up your data there, or use a tape library and back up your data there. As long as the data is off-site somewhere, it's, it's uh, protected from the, the same disaster that may uh, uh, destroy your primary facility, then uh, you're still left with the need to recover that data from wherever it happens to be 
to wherever you're going to do your recovery, rehost all the applications. In a hypervisor environment, that's uh, almost synonymous because a lot of your, your uh, data is, in fact, virtual machines. It's an entire application that's in the data. And uh, reconnect the users, okay? Similarly, if you go with asynchronous replication, you've got a remote location, maybe it's a big branch office, maybe it's a cloud, maybe it's a, a secondary uh, facility that's lights out most of the time. You can replicate your data on an asynchronous basis, meaning that uh, the data here is not necessarily identical to the data there. It's not fully populated with the latest and greatest uh, transactions. But uh, uh, you would basically be limiting your recovery tasks to rehosting your applications and reconnecting your users if most of the data that you need is already in place where you were going, okay? And then the third option, which is synchronous replication over distance, which is a real neat trick. Everybody talks about it and suggests that this is uh, uh, the way that they're doing their protection today, but I dare you to show me anybody who's getting truly synchronous replication at distances greater than 80 kilometers. You can't do it. I mean, Einstein's not, not on your side. So until we discover a way to latch data to the Higgs boson particle, which moves faster than the speed of light, or a tachyon or something like that, we're still stuck with the fact we're going to have data deltas. So we're going to have less than synchronous replication. But the theory is, if we have this more or less synchronous, near real-time failover capability, the only thing we'll be left to do is reconnect the networks. Okay, that, that's the simplest, least time to data. But as you can see, the cost accelerates the further up this food chain we go, and the time to data gets shorter the further up the food chain we go. It's the same as that previous slide, that previous model. Uh, we've just changed the names in certain cases. By the way, in the back is the man most directly responsible for recruiting me to be here today. So if you like what I say, uh, you can applaud him, Stefan Kochishan from CA. And if you don't like what I have to say, beat him up, not me. Okay. Now, uh, what, what basically, what the argument I hear from the hypervisor vendors and from other advocates of uh, failover clustering as the alternative to doing real disaster recovery is basically a, a very simplistic view of where downtime uh, comes from. 95% of the downtime companies experience are in those categories over there. It's usually a logical failure, a user error, a malware attack, a hacker, um, a, a application error. Uh, and of course, 30% of that 95% is what's known as scheduled downtime, okay? And only 5% of our disasters are capital D disasters, you know, CNN style disasters, stuff that we can get a, a, a team out there and cover in a news cycle for 24 to 48 hours, okay? Buildings on fire, you know, uh, fire and brimstone, you know, dogs and cats sleeping together, right? Mass hysteria, that, those are the kinds of big D disasters, but they really only account for about 5% of downtime annually. So what they say is, look, let's cover the 95% and we'll, we'll take whatever happens with this 5%. That's really bad thinking because, you know, here's what's happening with the big capital D disasters. I noted yesterday, uh, Hurricane Sandy was considered a one in 200 year storm. And then nine months later, we had a second one. Okay, these things are happening with a slightly greater frequency than what we've seen in the past, and that's just a, a small example. Uh, you know, if the climate change folks are right, we're probably going to have more weather-related disasters just through increased activity in the upper atmosphere. So whether it's colder winters and ice storms, or it's uh, hotter summers and droughts and lack of water, uh, or it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, hurricanes and other types of weather events, uh, you, we're going to see an uptick in that sort of thing. So unless you're in a very hardened military silo style facility, chances are you're going to be damaged either directly or indirectly by an event of that type at some point in your career. I've been on the ground for 32 years in IT and I've seen uh, a personally up front uh, just about every disaster we've had in that period of time. I, I did not go to Katrina, but uh, up until Katrina, 9-11, uh, uh, I was in New York. So, you know, we were helping to recover the 890 companies or something back into alternative work facilities after the towers came down. Anyway, you have one five, uh, you have one capital D disaster and it's going to spoil your whole day. That's the bottom line. So uh, I'm going to offer you 10 little best practices here that might be of value to you. I'm hoping that you walk out of here with at least one fresh idea or perspective. First of all, I'm going to say that uh, you have to do upfront analysis before you buy into any strategy from any vendor, any analyst, uh, any whatever. 
Uh, you cannot buy one size fits all disaster recovery. If you're, uh, you know, one size fits all, if you're a big guy like me, you know, it never fits you very well, okay? And you're never going to achieve any kind of cost efficiency out of a strategy that will be sufficient to uh, get management, cajole management into funding it. If, if you're just spending money and they think that you're not paying attention to the bottom line, no bucks, no buck rogers, right? You're not going to get any money to fund your project. So common sense dictates you start out with the, the assumption that not every business process you have in your organization is equally important. And that's true. Usually I walk into an organization, a large organization, may have thousands of business processes. But you go to senior management, and they can usually pick off for you five or six that they think, hey, these are real showstoppers. If these applications are not available to us, if these business processes go down for any reason, for any length of time, we're in deep doo-doo. So we're, we're, we need to pay close attention and prioritize the recovery and the sustainability and the survivability of these particular apps. They may be wrong. There may be interdependencies. Those apps rely on data that's generated from another app that they're not seeing because they're not close enough to the business process. But that's for you to ferret out. And the way that we traditionally do this is through a business process deconstruction analysis. Big words for just let's reverse engineer the business process. Chances are when you guys originally developed an application, you did a lot of book work on it, okay? You, I, we used to have binders and binders and binders of analysis, uh, entity relationship diagrams and uh, system requirement specifications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, you can fill a whole bookshelf with all the, the write-ups that were done and all the research that was done and all the analysis that was done before we even put the application into production. And we knew exactly what data was going to be created and where it was gonna go in the infrastructure. However, over a 10-year period, you may have 10 different owners of that business process. And each one makes his own little decisions about things. I was at a, a client site not long ago and they had migrated a 160 year old database off of a mainframe and onto an Oracle rack system and they were scratching their heads wondering, <clears throat> why is it so slow? And I asked, well, whose dumb idea was it to, to do this? And the IT manager got up and walked out of the room hanging his head low and everybody in the room started laughing. They said, it was him. Oracle said that they put his face on the front of the magazine if he would migrate the database over. So some of these are stupid human tricks and we just end up uh, losing control over how the application is platformed, where its data is going, what equipment it's using, what applications actually serve the business process, et cetera. And you have to deconstruct that. You have to go back through and actually find all that stuff out. That's the heavy lift of disaster recovery. The good news is that, that enterprise is also the foundational enterprise for doing effective data management, for doing effective data security, for doing just an archive, uh, governance, risk, and compliance. They all require that kind of in-depth analysis. I need to understand the business process, the platforms that it is using, the applications that serve it, and the data that it's creating. I need to know where that stuff is so I can handle it properly. In the old days, we used to refer to what we did as data processing. And we were the stewards of the corporate data, which was the most irreplaceable asset next to us. Okay? Today, we're IT. Sounds like we service parts on hardware. That's a bad, bad mistake. Okay? So it starts out with this impact analysis where you go out to the actual business users, line of business managers, and you talk to them and you say, what would be the cost? if this was interrupted for 24, 48, 72 hours. And then you start to probe into how is this actual business process delivered? What are the central tasks? What are the workflows? And what kind of automation is used to support those workflows? And you gotta document everything meticulously, okay? And then based on that analysis, the impact analysis, we set objectives. Okay, this is either a critical application or a, a, an important but not so critical or a vital application, whatever terminology you want to use to set classes of, of applications because data inherits its importance and its criticality like so much DNA from the business process that it serves. Okay, data by itself is anonymous ones and zeros. We don't know what the hell it is. And that has driven a lot of us to go for one-size-fits-all data replication strategies, which is why data replication is such a hole in the head. I mean, we, we clog up our networks and stuff, replicating data that doesn't need to be replicated. It isn't useful, or it doesn't support a critical app, and it doesn't need to be replicated with the frequency that maybe a critical app does. 
And so we set our recovery objectives, and I call it time to data. Some of you call it recovery time objective, recovery point objective, I don't care what you call it, but the fact is from a pragmatic standpoint, it's how fast can I put my company back on a paying basis if there's an interruption. So I look at that and I measure that amount of time. That's called time to data, okay? And underneath that, I'm going to also establish criticality and priority of restore. Some applications need to be brought up first before another application can be fully restored. And we need to understand those nuances of interrelationship. Those things go into sort of the workflow for recovery, all right? And then finally, the recovery strategy. Based on your, your objectives, you're going to start considering what kind of technologies are available to help us do the recovery. Uh, what kinds of steps are the most efficient? What has been the experience of other companies? Uh, what has been, what's available technology-wise to accomplish this stuff? And then more importantly, what is the budget support? Can I afford any of this stuff? Maybe the best I can do is a backup. Maybe I can't do real-time replication. Maybe I can't do synchronous because we're going over great distance. Maybe I have to settle for asynchronous. What's the best way to accomplish that? Okay, they're trade-offs. It's the practical part of doing the job. And we also should be considering something called testing efficacy. Right now, the most expensive part of disaster recovery isn't the software and the hardware and the cloud services that you buy. It is the cost to test because you're gathering a group of your personnel and you're taking them off site and you're going to go through a, a rehearsal of how you would go about doing the job and hey, if somebody forgets the right data and whatever, we have to call the test off and reschedule it for another time and it gets to be ugly. And most companies who report, there are less than 50% of companies do disaster recovery planning. And of that, fewer than 50% test their plans which is the equivalent of having no plan at all. Plans fall out of step just like that with the realities of the environment that they're intended to recover. We have to stay on top of it. I wanna to automate to the greatest possible extent all of our recovery tasks so that when we do testing, it's more testing to advise personnel of what their roles will be and to get all the vendors who we're relying on on board so they understand when the call comes, these are the things you're going to have to do. I don't want to be testing, can we recover our data? I want to see a screen that says your data is in a good place. All you got to do is push a button and you've got it. Okay, I want to automate that stuff so I don't have to include that in the testing regimen at all. Otherwise, I'm going to kill myself with the cost of testing. Okay, data protection remains your first line of defense. Those who were in my workshop saw this, this uh, chart yesterday. Uh, you know, if you think about it just from a, a uh, this kind of a, a, a physical depiction, data is the chewy goodness of the inside of the Tootsie Pop, okay? And right next to it are a whole bunch of disaster potentials that relate to the data. They're logical things, they're equipment faults that have to do with a disk drive or with a, a, a flash drive or whatever, the, the nearby location events, okay? And then you've got the facility disasters. The rest of the world is running just fine, but your facility sprung a leak in a pipe and you've got sewage coming into your data center and the health department won't let your people work there even in hazmat suits until you get that cleaned up, okay? And don't, don't say that never happens because it happens more frequently than you would expect, okay? Uh, the other uh, outer box is the milieu level disasters. These are things where there's an ice storm and nobody can get to work because the roads are unpassable or a hurricane with a big geographical footprint. Sandy, what was really interesting about Sandy was that some of my clients were sandbagging their facilities in New York, which made no sense because their data center was in the basement and you know, water rises, okay? And so their basement was flooded. And they said, well, that's okay. We have recovery over at this hot site over in Philadelphia. The footprint of Sandy was from Manhattan to Philadelphia and they were getting water too, okay? So, you know, you gotta look at the reality. That may be a one in 200 year storm until it happens nine months later, right? All right, and we also have to include security threats. People have been artificially divorcing security from disaster recovery for too long. And it was really a function of vendors trying to sell a product. I mean, with no offense to CA, uh, if you wanted to get a security credential, you wanted to be a, a master blaster of security with a certificate you could hang on your wall, okay? What'd you do? You went to a, an ACF2 uh, 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 boot camp and you learned how to use ACF2. And that made you a specialist in security. Or you went to IBM RACF school. 
or you went to top secret school or whatever, okay? It was easy to come up with the parameters of what a certification would be because you were being certified in an application. There is no application for disaster recovery. It's a straightforward application of common sense, okay? So it's a little more challenging to find a rigid definition and a way to just certify people. I give certifications away to anybody who's willing to sit through the workshops that I do because it's, it's a, a topic that nobody really wants to think about and I wanna give them some, some uh, you know, encouragement. Okay, there are other people who sell certifications for tens of thousands of dollars. I think it's ridiculous, but uh, if you want to spend your money, that's a good way to do it, I guess. The truth is that your physical risks, which are the domain of disaster recovery and business continuity, and your security risks, which are uh, you know, a function of the security parameter, are actually, uh, they overlap, and especially in the area of data, because data is the blood of your organization, and you cannot have it tainted or corrupted in any way, whether it's by a machine failure or an application failure, or by some nitwit kids who decide that they want to establish their bona fides by trashing your system, okay? Or worse yet, by hackers who decide they want to, uh, uh, you know, throw a little hitch in the, the gear here so they can charge you ransom to have access to your own data. Process criticality sets your time objectives. It sets all the objectives for restoral, but security concerns are taking greater center, center stage now. And the good news is that there are some additional technologies now. It's not just about access control. Uh, you know, some of our governance, risk, and compliance requirements for data protection uh, are actually derived from what kinds of data you're storing. So you have to secure that data by encrypting it. Encryption has a, a, a very interesting set of impacts on disaster recovery because you have to have the keys to unlock the data in order to restore the data, okay? You not only have to have access, you also have to have the, uh, the crypto, okay? And what's interesting is most people are encrypting everything because they're not sure what may be, may contain important data. Again, that's one size fits all thinking, and it's gonna blow your budget, and it's gonna slow your disaster recovery down to a grinding halt. The worst thing that can happen to you when you have a disaster is that the guy who handles security in your organization got clipped by whatever the disaster was that took down your facility, and he's the only guy who knew where the passwords were. And it happens more often than you would expect. Okay, so kind of important. Why don't we instead look at the data itself and see, are there elements, are there, are there uh, names or words or concepts in the data that require encryption based on governance, risk, and compliance policy? You know, PCI, the credit card guys, <clears throat> they have identified probably 100 different terms that must be encrypted if you're going to be PCI compliant, okay? And what if there was some software that could quickly look through your inventory of data and spot <coughs> those fields? Okay, so they alert you to the fact that you have fields in this that are considered uh, crypto worthy. Okay, there, there are tools for doing this, they've existed for a while, but most of them require that you violate your own security in order to use them. You had to offload the data from the mainframe over to an x86 platform, do your analysis there, generate a report, and then go back and manually fix up the crypto on the, on the mainframe data. Well, this year, I think you'll be able to see it, if I'm not mistaken, down on the exhibit floor, CA has released a new product called DCD that actually does this with the data that's instantiated already in your mainframe so you don't have to copy it anywhere. Okay, that's kind of a cool innovation. Now, does it actually do it for you? No, it's kind of like those commercials where the guy says, I'm a dental monitor. I've just found that you have a cavity. And the guy says, well, aren't you gonna fix it? And he goes, I'm just the monitor. I tell you that you have the cavity. You have to fix the cavity. So after you uh, discover this, then you need to use all the crypto tools that are available to encrypt that data. All right. I would also like everybody to acknowledge reality here. We've been nursing the misperception for a very long time that mainframes were invulnerable to hacking and malware and things of that nature, which are the plague of, uh, of x86, okay, the plague of, of distributed computing. The, the truth of the matter is that's changing very rapidly. One of the things that encourages change is we've moved to a, a Linux operating system on a lot of mainframes, which means all the skills that the little script kitties had for Linux systems are transferable into the mainframe now as well. You also have pathways into the mainframe now from the distributed environment that didn't exist before. 
Some of them are coming through the cloud relationship. Some of them are coming from the mobile computing relationship. Some of them are coming from all that virtualized junk that's in between the systems of interaction and the systems of engagement. Okay? Uh, it's increased the attack service. This is what I'm talking about. Your hybrid cloud data center model, courtesy of IBM, but many other companies have latched on this as well. Basically, the way it's supposed to work is this, mobile commerce, Christmas time, Black Friday, okay? Everybody takes out their little laptop and their smartphone and their tablet and they go on Amazon and they just start to look for all the Christmas, you know, all the little gifts for all the people on their Christmas list, right? And they, they use their little mobile app. Well, unfortunately, a lot of mobile apps out there are like an open invitation for hackers We'll, we'll talk about this in a second. I want to get ahead of myself. The way the story goes is you've got these wonderful systems of engagement. The bigger the screen, the more money people are going to spend, by the way. <laughs> Turns out that if you want to sell a lot of stuff, try to get people to use a tablet or have them use a laptop with a big screen because they buy more the bigger the picture is. It, it's true. I, I don't know why. Okay? Now, they communicate their requests back to systems of interaction. These are mostly virtual machines running in an x86 environment, usually with their own little silos of storage behind them. Okay? There's a lack of, of commonality between them, and oftentimes they're not even checking with each other on anything. But what they do do is they refer the request, in part, over to systems of insight. What are systems of insight? They're running MapReduce. They're running Hadoop. Their x86 cluster infrastructures and your credit card information goes over there so they can validate that you are who you say you are and there's enough money in your account to afford what you're trying to buy. But the smart companies have gone even further. They're taking your customer profile data so they can upsell you. Oh, you know, the last time you were here at Amazon, you were looking over here at, at weightlifting equipment. Did you manage to take off those few pounds, or are you still interested? Because we're, we've got a 30% sale on treadmills today. Why don't you add that to your ticket? Upsell, okay? And they're target marketing, and they're good at it, okay? That, that really accounts for, that's the icing on the cake. All right, now, at the end of the day, for every transaction that's completed on the system of interaction after confirmation by the system of insight, we generate what's known as the starburst effect, 100 transactions into the systems of record. That's a massive amount of traffic that's heading over to your mainframe or it's heading over to large system environments, whatever they may be, which are running what, what the, the little script kitties derogatorily refer to as legacy applications. ERP, okay, all your inventory management stuff, all your logistics control, the stuff that actually makes money for the company, you know, every transaction that's processed on the back end is how your company derives revenue. They don't derive any revenue directly from this other stuff, unless you're in the business of providing big data analysis you're probably not making any money off of big data. What you're making money from is the fulfillment of the transactions on the back end. Okay, please, let's all just be serious about this. And then we have, to support these efforts, infrastructure as a service and DR as a service and other types of services provided by clouds. They're supposed to give you the ability to build your base, your primary systems, and buy your burst. When you over exceed the capacity that you've got, you can rent it temporarily from a cloud. If you're doing DR and you don't want to have a, build a redundant facility, use a DRAS provider and replicate there. I'd recommend strongly that you pay attention to who that DRAS provider is, because just as we had the experience in hot sites of a guy selling subscriptions to a hot site that didn't really exist, okay, we were ripe to see that happen again. San Diego, University of San Diego just discovered the hard way that the company they thought they were replicating data to, the cloud-based DRAS provider over in Arizona, didn't really have any facilities at all. When the data got over there, they were discarding it. Okay, that's pretty bad. All right, now, this process, when it works well, it makes everybody rich and happy. Customers go on Twitter and say, I love doing business with these guys, and owners are really happy because they're making a ton of money selling product, okay? What's not to love? Millions of transactions, trillions of transactions a day. And you can ha pat yourselves on the back because you're the miracle workers. Most of these transactions are going all across a little thin filament of fiber optic cable, okay? And, and they're somehow magically resulting in a product getting under the Christmas tree so a kid has a smile on his face on Christmas morning, okay? 
you're the heroes, right? And that should be the end of the movie. However, it really isn't. When you look at it, our open door for hacker attacks and for all the security risks begins at the mobile app. Mobile apps are the worst, worst thing that ever happened to computing in terms of security. They're an open door. They're a gateway into your system. Okay? I'm giving you a whole bunch of references here, by the way. When you download the copy of this, you can go look up the references. Uh, systems of interaction, of course. We all know about the vulnerability of x86. And hypervisor-based computing is just as vulnerable as, as physical computing. Okay? And then the systems of insight. We have the, uh, uh, we have uh, e-commerce times is saying that systems of insight are inevitably the targets of attacks. Why? Because they want to get the data, the credit card information for all the customers who are buying stuff. And so those are the targets I would target if I were a bad guy, right? And then finally, these cloud guys. Who knows what's going on with the cloud guys? You know, uh, I think we just got a lesson the hard way when the, the J-20 fighter appeared in the skies at the, at the air show, Chinese stealth fighter, looks identical to the F-35 because they went into the DOD cloud and took all the blueprints for the F-35 and went and made it. And, uh, you know, clouds are a little insecure. I don't think that's going away. And then systems of record are the prize. That's what the hackers have always wanted, but they didn't necessarily have a, a, an available machine in the basement to do their test scripts on or whatever. Now they can get access to mainframe technology in a cloud, and they can do their testing of their attack where there, or they can simply enter through one of the other modes of attack. And with a Linux operating system, some of the concepts are transferable to help that along. So we have to get past the point of believing that mainframes are somehow invulnerable and start taking them into account in our overall uh, effort here. And then number five, defense in depth. We have to start thinking that there isn't one size fits all technology. If we're doing data protection, we have to defend that data in a manner appropriate for that data. If it's data that's accessed frequently for a mission critical application and it changes frequently, you're probably gonna want something like continuous data protection in addition to whatever other, other steps you're using to protect that data. Continuous data protection sees a transaction that's about to happen, sees what blocks are going to be impacted by that transaction. They take a copy of those blocks and they move them somewhere else with a little timestamp on them. And they say, this is what it looked like before that transaction updated. Okay, and they keep doing that so until you got a tape like DVR. Like, a, like your digital video recorder, and you can back it up to a particular point in time before a hacker attack occurred. The most obvious use of that technology is to guard against a ransomware attack. Because if you know that the ransomware bug has been put in there at this point, you go to just before that ransomware bug appeared. And you may have to discard or recreate some transactions, but at least it gets you to a point before the data was corrupted. Uh, prior to that, we were using things like point-in-time mirror split imaging which was basically taking, uh, uh, this was an EMC thing, and they charged $83,000 for the software, and they'd take one disk and stick it next to another disk, create a mirror, fill that disk up, and then at periodic intervals, quiesce the application, flush the cache data down to disk one, copy into disk two, put a timestamp on disk two, take it off the line, take more of your most expensive disk, and, and uh, set up another mirror. And at the end of the day, you had multiple copies of your data with timestamps on them saying that this was at two o'clock, this was at three o'clock, this was at four o'clock. But what they forgot to tell you was that most database corruption events weren't detected for 24 to 48 hours after they occurred, by which time every copy you had was corrupt. So it was kind of a pointless way of doing it. Some of the more, uh, te the techniques that are being used today are maybe a little more efficacious than that. But the point is that there are different ways to do disaster recovery data protection each one has a different set of foibles and a different set of capabilities. You may have to use some in concert with each other. Okay, you may have to use different ones depending on different kinds of data. An archive, for example, may be very suited to a uh, simple tape backup because archival data doesn't change very often. So maybe you do it once a week or a once a month backup of that data. Okay, uh, alternatively, uh, your transaction system for the Christmas rush is probably being updated on a per second basis. You're gonna need a different set of capabilities. And the trick is going to be finding a way to wrangle all of the different technologies you're using so that you have one pane of glass and you don't have to go out and support 15 different uh, 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 products in order to get the job done on data protection. 
Okay, and one thing that's making a, a new appearance again for the third time in my career is virtual tape. Okay, virtual tape is what? Virtual tape is basically a buffer of media ahead of a tape library usually, although sometimes the tape library goes away and they just use the virtual tape. And it started out originally as a place where we stacked up tape write jobs because mainframes were really terrible at writing tape. They would write just a little bit on a tape and then eject it and then write a little bit on the next tape and eject it and so forth. And you ended up spending all kinds of money on tape, okay? So instead what they said was, why don't we write it to a virtual tape library and stack them up until we can fill a full tape and then we'll write the job to the tape. And that will let us use our tape cartridges more efficiently. Well, that isn't as big a problem anymore because tape cost is actually in uh, the sub, sub dollar per gigabyte range now. But uh, it, we did see another evolution of this technology where we simply increased the number of virtual tape drives that were in the system using a virtual tape library. That let us stream more data to that target and write it faster so we could shrink the amount of time required to do the backup. Uh, to fit in our operational windows. That was generation two. Generation three is a VTL is whatever we say it is. So you had uh, data domain come in and they said, we're gonna deduplicate the data and we're gonna charge you $410,000 for $13,000 worth of hardware to do it. Cause you're gonna get every drive is gonna be like 70 disk drives cause that deduplication. Nobody ever got 70 to one, but you know, that, that was how they sold it. And they sold the heck out of it. They, they create a whole market for it, okay? So that was just one approach. What, what we've been seeing, though, is an effort now to go back to the concept of a VTL using just software and any available disk you've got. CA has probably one of the world-class products in this space, the VTape product, which basically lets you use any DASI you got on the floor as a buffer ahead of a tape library or as ahead of a cloud or by itself. And you can manage it all from a single pane of glass. Pretty good product, okay? Now, in a nutshell, this is how this, this strategy works. You know, you basically are storing your backup uh, uh, from your primary array over to a VTL. And the VTL stores that data until it copies it off-site. This fits the old 321 idea. Three copies of data, two different kinds of media, one of them off-site, okay? That sounds like a pretty good strategy, except that basically, from a restore perspective, it's even better. Recovery from logical and local faults can be done at the speed of light from the local instantiation in the VTL of the, of the primary data. So if you have a data corruption event in the array, you can restore that data very rapidly, okay? That's cool, okay? But if you have that big smoke and rubble disaster, that capital D disaster, you got your data hopefully safely located in a way off-site location, where it isn't gonna be consumed by the same disaster that consumes your primary data center, and by the way, your VTL, which happens to be in your primary data center. Okay, so uh, it's a pretty good uh, strategy. I mean, it's an intelligent strategy. A lot of people are saying, oh, well, we're gonna do that in clouds. Well, let me go back for a second because I may have pushed that twice. Clouds were really cool. You remember when clouds, uh, cloud advertisements looked like this? It was sort of like a toilet paper ad. You know, it was fluffy white clouds and there's your data center in the sky and uh, uh, hot air balloons and, and rainbows and sunflowers and stuff like that. Except that the cloud guys all kind of align themselves with the various hypervisor vendors. Now all of a sudden we had proprietary clouds, clouds that only supported one kind of workload or workload that was only instantiated in one kind of hypervisor software and they threw their lot in with this company or that company or whatever. Now it became sort of a management hassle because you have to find not only a cloud, but a cloud that can back up a cloud and they all have to support the same technology. All, all these silos of technology that we've created have created silos in the cloud space as well, okay? That's kind of a big problem. Now, the other thing is with clouds, that a cloud to be effective for data protection and disaster recovery needs to be at least 80 to 100 kilometers away from your facility. That's 40 to 60 miles, right? If, it is, if it's within 40 to 60 miles, it's in the same disaster zone as, uh, or danger zone as your primary facility. Except most people don't even check to see where their cloud is located. They have a DRAS provider that comes in, they've got a good brochure or a good website or whatever, let's go. Okay. A lot of companies discovered after uh, the, the hurricanes that hit New York that their DR as a service provider was in a building across the street. They had exactly the same problem that they were confronting. 
and nobody knew it. In fact, I was doing some work for, for uh, I can't say the client, the NFL, and, and uh, or Katrina hit uh, and took out the email servers for um, uh, uh, the New Orleans Saints. And if you know anything about the NFL, their entire organization runs on email. It's 16 weeks of, of a movable feast, and it's all coordinated with email. And when that server went down, they needed the servers replaced quick in a hurry. And they were prepping and drop shipping them a new server to replace the ones that got waterlogged. Okay, but all their data from the servers was backed up to an online uh, backup company. And the online backup company didn't know everybody was gonna want their data back at once. It took over a year to restore their data. If you're thinking about this stuff, please, Pay attention to the reality, especially the reality of, of the distances involved. Latency and jitter are the killers of off-site data replication, okay? Uh, whether you consider your, your uh, a cloud provider to be a, the great disk drive in the sky or the great tape drive in the sky, and by the way, more and more of the public clouds are going to tape on the back end. Uh, kind of interesting turn of events for people who said tape sucks, move on, okay? All of a sudden, tape is finding a real home, right? All right, they're, if they're within 80 to 100 kilometers, they're at the same risk of the same hurricane, okay, the same disaster. All right, and that, the real problem here is data deltas. Anybody who deals with WANs understands what I'm talking about. For every, uh, you know, here's your source disk, here's your target disk. For every 100 kilometers that data travels, the rule of thumb is you're 12 SCSI rights behind. So 12 operations, SCSI operations, behind for every 100 kilometers at your, at your remote. Now, is that a problem? For archival data, it probably isn't. For mission critical transaction processing, you darn skippy it may be. May destroy your ability to fail over to an identical database over at the other facility. And I don't care if you're doing this with mainframes, you're doing it with, with uh, x86 Tinker Toys. Fact is that they're, they're all vulnerable because that's the nature of the data. And then you have to deal with the fact that jitter is involved here as well. You don't own the wire between you and the cloud or between you and your redundant facility or you and your branch office. You're more than likely going over public switch telephone network and a service provided over the top of the wires that already exist, okay? Which means that you're sharing that facility, which means that every packet that you're sending on to that link is going to be serialized. It has to be put in order with uh, packets of a whole lot of other people who are coming in at the same time. And then from that point, it gets into a queue for delivery. And what a lot of companies are reporting now, or a lot of the internet, uh, or the ILEX and the CLEX, the uh, exchange carriers are reporting, is something called buffer bloat. They have actually exceeded the sizes of the memory buffers they have on their switches from all the traffic that gets buffered up. A lot of that traffic isn't mission critical traffic because they're sharing that same link that you're using with people who are uploading you know, 4K videos of, of their kid smashing their face into the ketchup container at McDonald's. Okay, because they think that's like noteworthy and something they have to hold on to for all posterity. And there's all kinds of video data that's being uploaded constantly to the same cloud service that's providing you your disaster recovery. All right, and then processing. You know, we have to process all the packets in order. We have to make sure they get to the right destinations. We have to confirm those. We have to confirm the receipt all the way back to the origin, et cetera. There's a lot of compute that goes into that. And then finally, the, the totality of all this is a propagation delay. Jitter, a split, uh, you know, a moment. If you're trying to watch a YouTube video and it pauses for a second while it buffers, okay, it's partly a function of jitter. All right. So these are the realities of the WAN world. And no, it doesn't help to compress the data or to deduplicate the data. This is a boondoggle. Anybody says, oh, yes, but it's, it's deduplicated data. If you look out the window of your office at the local, you know, uh, uh, highway, and at certain times of the day it gets congested. Is the smart car really moving any faster than the 18-wheeler? It doesn't matter if you've compressed the data. The data is in a pathway that is already congested, and it isn't going to move any faster because you squeezed it down. The aggregate of reducing 4 terabytes to 2 terabytes means that the data will transfer faster in totality but it doesn't mean the data is going to reach its destination any faster. So we got to get real about that. The reality of WANs is that at T1, if you're moving 10 terabytes of data, you're looking at four and a half years to move it to its destination. 10,000 hours 
to move 10 terabytes. Today, in a larger data center, we're talking about exabyte size storage repositories. We're not talking about terabyte size. Small terabyte, 10 terabyte transfer, taking over four years with the standard T1, with the most expensive link you can get right now, OC192, at nine gigabits per second, it's gonna take two and a half hours to move 10 terabytes. And that's on a perfect day, line of sight, no latency, no jitter. Okay, think about that. And then think about the reality that the alternative is uh, IPOAC, Internet Protocol over Avian Carrier. What is that? It's when you take your little USB key and you strap it to the leg of a passenger pigeon and you send it to the remote data center that way. And you know what? They do this test every year. They do it in Africa, Europe, and the United States. Uh, Georgia Tech and, and uh, Stanford and the other guys are all involved in it. It's always, you know, 20,000 grad students with their hair on fire. And they actually do this test every year. And the pigeon always gets there first, gets there before the data does on the wire. Okay? So maybe your next investment is in good old-fashioned passenger pigeon technology. All right, IBM and Duke University are puzzling over this problem right now. There, there is a remarkable exchange of data going on in Business Resiliency Future on the, on the Smarter Computing blog, if you want to read up on this. They say, imagine that you have two interdependent production databases, A and B, and you've got copies of those databases in a cloud service provider, and you're doing data replication over to the cloud. Okay, and the numbers here, 4433, represent the state, how many transactions have fully processed and been recorded. And over a period of time, the process worsens. And let's say B becomes non-viable and we want to fail over and connect up production A to production B2. Now we've got a differential of how many? Four uh, 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 transactions that we, we're different between the two. Chances of being able to fail over that application are abysmally low unless you've provided for the differential that's going to occur, the delta in the data. So if you think just hooking up to a cloud service is going to fix your problem, you're wrong. Check it. Uh, actually stop the application and see if it can be recovered over on the other side. Duke University is proving right now that you can't. So this is not a miracle cure for what ails disaster recovery. We're gonna have to outthink this problem. All right, and don't count out tape. I know a lot of people say tape is dead. It was killed by the uh, disk, and then it was killed by sands, and then it was killed by uh, clouds, and you know, that's all horse shit. Pardon me, that's, uh, you can extract that from the video, but it's true. Um, uh, first of all, companies are finding that just like uh, you can move data over distance more efficiently on the leg of a passenger pigeon, you can also move data more efficiently by writing it to a tape and sticking it in an overnight courier. And it's the only way to mass move data that works. And there's called cloud seeding when you do it up to a cloud. Isn't that cute? It's cloud seeding, like using silver nitrate to get water. Uh, and basically, recent innovations have given tape a whole new lease on life. If you were of the crowd that was saying, we're going to phase tape out of our environment, forget about it. It's coming back in a big way. In fact, Microsoft is now going to tape. Um, Google has a big investment in tape, but Microsoft just made a huge investment in tape for Azure. Okay, and Amazon is even using tape now. And that Jeff Bezos used to say, no way, we're never going to use tape. Tape is your father's Oldsmobile. Okay, not so much anymore. Today, we first of all, we've seen tape improve because of capacity improvements enabled by perpendicular magnetic recording. For those of you who remember, back in the late 1990s, we were concerned that disk drives were running out of speed. We were writing data on disk drives in parallel tracks. And when you put the two, tra uh, two bits close enough together, and we were squeezing them as tightly as we could on the track, it was like when you played with magnets when you were a kid, one magnet would flip because they were both positive poles, right? And that caused the lingerie you bought for your girlfriend to be sent to your mother and kind of spoiled the effect, okay? It was called random bit flipping. So instead, what we did was we figured out a way, courtesy of uh, uh, Iwasaki, basically, to write the data uh, like shooting arrows into the ground if you were Robin Hood and have the, the, the polar bits on each end upright and down below. That's called perpendicular magnetic recording. And it breathed new life into disk drives. And we were able to grow the capacity of disk drives from the maximum we have with parallel of about 750 gigabits per, sec uh, per, per inch to uh, where we're at right now, which is way in excess of that. Unfortunately, we're running out of speed on that as well. 
So in the future, we're going to have to think up something new because we're kind of running out of, out of space. Now, people thought that you wouldn't be able to do this with tape because on a disc, you have a rigid surface. On tape, you have flexible mylar. And you didn't have a, a, a composite you could sputter coat onto tape that could do perpendicular magnetic until they discovered uh, it was Saki's old thing about barium ferrite. Barium ferrite is a crystalline metal that when you send a static electric charge through it, it stands up on end, just like perpendicular magnetic recording on a disk, except it's a function of the sputter coating. Okay? So barium ferrite has allowed us to demonstrate already 220 terabytes uncompressed on an LTO cartridge. Pretty good. That'll be available by early 2020s, right? Yeah. And barium ferrite is now de rigueur. If you look at the, the uh, uh, LTO consortium roadmap since generation seven of LTO, it's all barium ferrite coating. Metal particle is out. Okay? And it's also been adopted by IBM and Oracle on their tape products as well, getting outstanding capacity improvements on a per cartridge basis. Okay, now improvements in the media are just beginning. The other thing that's happened in the tape world that's worth noting is linear tape file system, LTFS, which is now not just a product from IBM, it's actually an ISO standard. And so you can get it from a number of different vendors and it's the same stuff regardless of what vendor you get it from. What is LTO? It's basically taking the data that you've recorded to your flash or your, your disk array and writing that data natively in its file system format or in its object system format directly to tape. You don't need to use backup software to do it. You don't need to use archive software to do it. It's just like when you put a USB key into the side of your laptop and you copy files from your file system directly onto the thing and it's readable by that file system if you plug the USB key into another system. You no longer have to worry about special adjunct software to do a backup. You got some data over here in your file system you need to back up, copy it, just like you would from one disk to another disk, except it goes out to tape instead. And you can store a hell of a lot more of it in a much more dense footprint on tape. Okay, this is a godsend for a lot of reasons. Uh, LTF is very easy to implement, whether you do it on a server, you do it on a mainframe. It was designed originally for servers, but you can put it on a, on a Z mainframe too. Uh, it's basically the sources of data, the workflows and the individuals write their data to the server. The server has its native a file system that everybody knows and loves. It ingests the files. It may create little stubs of the files, and I'll explain why in a second. And then it writes the data through the connectivity that's provided on that box to the back end tape library, writes it directly to the tape in its native file format, but it converts it to LTFS. So that at the beginning of the tape cartridge is an index, and there's a track or a partition in the tape that's storing the start and the end of the file plus the metadata describing the file. And then from the start point to the end point is all the actual data of the file. This is kind of cool. This is neat technology, it's drool proof, okay? And it writes it over to the LTFS, and then when you wanna find data, your users come down to whatever the, the interface is, whether it's your mainframe or a, a file server or whatever, and they request the files, the files are located on the tape, and then they get returned to, there we go, get returned back to the, to the requester. Now you've got a way to store the more than 60% of your data that isn't transactional, it's file systems. Okay, this is very efficient and very clean, and it has breathed new life into tape. Tape is enjoying a tremendous renaissance right now. Even if your staff is tape adverse, and believe me, the industrial farmers of the cloud uh, uh, were very tape adverse. They were, they were populated by guys who were in app dev, and they hate tape. They hate anything that isn't flash. It should be silicon everywhere, because that's cool, okay? But the fact is that they're looking at the reality that we're generating between 10 and 60 zettabytes of new data by 2020. Zettabyte is a thousand exabytes. Uh, an exabyte is a thousand petabytes. Got it? A lot of data, right? And the problem is that the annual production of capacity in the disk and in the flash market is insufficient. It's 780 exabytes of capacity per year generated in the disk market. It is 500 exabytes of capacity generated each year in the flash market. Where are you going to store 10 to 60 zettabytes of data? Okay, it's creating what we're calling the zettabyte apocalypse. 
okay, where, uh, you know, the guys in the clouds are really afraid, who's, how are we going to store all the data? And so are large data centers, by the way, okay? So, the most important thing is to start an archive today. This, if you walk out of here and do nothing else before you even do disaster recovery, start archiving. Archiving will pull all the data that doesn't change very frequently out of your system. It will restore between 30 and 70 percent of the capacity of the production storage infrastructure you already own if you just do an archive to tape. That will pay for your disaster recovery plan, it will pay for your security plan, it will pay for your governance risk and compliance plan just from the cost savings associated with effective archiving. I really can't stress that enough. And the real problem is that there's a cadre of idiots out there who are saying all this tiering uh, needs to go away. We need to go to something else. And you say, well, you know, frankly, we can do it all pretty simply with LTFS. We can take file systems in their native format and write them off to tape. That's an easy way to do an archive, right? Or we can apply some of our cognitive computing capabilities and we can use that to do hierarchical storage management down to archive and do it in an intelligent automated way simply by generating policies that are associated with the data. So if you have a mission critical application, the data from that application gets treated as mission critical for the first 30 days or whatever, you apply services to that data and migrate it to the right kind of storage. And then after 30 days that policy in the background migrates it to another kind of storage with different kinds of policies for data protection, and then finally puts it in a preservation kit, an archive. And you don't have to be involved with it at all. There are a number of companies working on this right now. IBM has all the ingredients to do it, but they haven't pulled them all together into a solution yet. Uh, one company is working on it right now, if you want to see an early adopter, is a company called Strongbox Data Solutions in Canada. They have a product called Stronglink, and it does just what I'm describing, cognitive computing to migrate data per policy. Which brings us back to uh, uh, the end of this, best practice number 10, okay? If you haven't done this yet, let's get started. Let's do it today, okay? This is a, a good time to start. Downtime really isn't an option. We should be working to make sure that our data remains available. We should be working to make sure that we have uh, created the best possible recovery outcome if we have those disasters that we can't avoid, okay? And it's your job to do it. It's everybody's job to do it in IT. The methodology for building a plan hasn't changed very much. I wrote the, this methodology back in 1982. And frankly, I still use it today in a lot of shops I go into. It's a structured, uh, you know, structured systems analysis approach that IBM was pitching for 30 years back in, uh, beginning back in the 60s. Okay, there's nothing special about the disaster recovery. The chief obstacles are what they've always been. The perception that this is just so much more insurance, that it isn't going to work, that we can just do high availability and we don't need disaster recovery anymore. Okay, these are idiotic assumptions. And unfortunately, sometimes management refuses to fund a project because they read a, a, an article somewhere that said this is old man thinking and they want to be visionary. Okay, so my final advice, and this would be number, 12, uh, number 11, is lie call it something else. Don't call it disaster recovery. Don't call it data protection. Call it data management. Call it governance, risk, and compliance. Call it keeping management off the front page of, of the Wall Street Journal uh, you know, with a clown suit on saying that they accidentally exposed the patient healthcare data of two million people. Okay, because nobody likes to think that might happen to them. Put it in personal terms they can understand. All right, that's what I came here to say. I hope it's been useful. If you have any questions, I'm, I, I'm, I'm here for you. If you don't have any questions, I get to go rest my voice until I have to go talk again. Is that okay? Thank you all very much.